Um, Christina, do you want to describe? I'm all set up. I'm all ready right. to go. <laughs> right. um, okay. Public oh, commentary right. would be first. Have you wanted anything to say in the public, or you want to, we're going to get to your topic self? He's, he's an agenda item. So. He's an agenda item. Uh, I'll uh, welcome a motion to approve the minutes of uh, March 13th. Second. Okay. Any, any discussion on minutes? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, Todd, since you are here, I'm going to take these out of order. And um, go ahead and introduce the. And actually, since you're here, why don't you go ahead and make a statement? I mean, to, to put it in context, uh, the city was sent a number of questions, which Hampshire Council very nicely answered <laughs> for us. <laughs> um, and uh, I have sat down with Ken Elstein today uh, to go over uh, those, those answers, but as you guys know, I, I sent you all a copy. And if you have any questions on them, or clarifications, or points you want to make about your answers, this is an opportunity. And Todd is here from Hampshire Council. Todd, why don't you go ahead and take it from there and kind of place, the, place it in context a little bit more. OK, uh, great, thanks. So as you probably all know, you are one of uh, 37 communities that is filed uh, with the Hampshire Council of Governments uh, Municipal Aggregation Program. Uh, and the process so far is going uh, very smoothly and very well. Uh, the DOER, uh, after consultation with the towns, uh, has issued a letter of uh, support. Uh, that then moved it on to the DPU. The DPU uh, very quickly scheduled a public hearing, uh, and the DPU decided to come to this very room uh, to hold the public hearing, which is uh, unheard of. Uh, usually we have to go to Boston for that. Uh, so the public hearing is on next Tuesday, tax day the 15th at 6 o'clock uh, in this room. I believe Christy will be speaking on behalf of uh, the town and the mayor, perhaps? I think I'm going to say a sentence. Yep, good. <laughs> so that's all that's needed. Um, and the answers to those questions that you referenced are due the next day on the 16th. Uh, and uh, we are already in the process of printing uh, some of that. We estimate, uh, unfortunately, about 2,000 pieces of paper will be submitted to DPU because each town has to have the answer. So. Uh, it's part of the bureaucracy of uh, dealing with the process. But going along very quickly, very smoothly, uh, and uh, the hearing should be, uh, in, in essence, a, a non-event. We're asking some representatives from participating towns to make statements of support, uh, and uh, the DPU will conclude their business and uh, head back to Boston and keep the process moving. Uh, so all good news, uh, going along smoothly, and glad to answer any questions that you may have as to the questions or, or anything else that has come up. I have just two comments in the form, and I, I know actually nothing about what the DPU is looking for. Maybe it's normal, but, um, and it's great that you guys wrote the answers. But because that tagline there, you know, written by Hampshire, yeah. I don't know if they're looking, I don't know if we want a fiction that says it's from, it was written by the city, and if that matters or not. I, I don't really no, care. No, they, they, they want it, that we ran into that before, and they want it, one person, if you put your name on it, then if it goes through a hearing, then you can get called up to okay. testify and all that. So you try to protect the city of town. Okay. And then the second is also not known the format, but the answers to the questions were really terse. Yeah. And if that's what they want, then that's fine with me. But I was Less is more with the DPA. Okay. Yeah. I have one comment or question on the first answer, which is then uh, referred to in the next couple. It just seems a little bit ambitious to think that the Hampshire Council is going to develop and support energy efficiency, renewable energy, and green technologies in the region for you know a few pennies on the aggregation fee. Doesn't that strike you as being a little ambitious? Uh, no. Uh, and I, develop the, and support technologies? Well, we're, we're, the Hampshire Council already developed, not technologies, but programs. Uh, the Council already uh, does that through various solar programs and certainly through our work with Hampshire Power. We're working very hard in Hampshire Power, different from the aggregation, but in Hampshire Power to secure all of our energy from uh, New England-based uh, green energy uh, facilities. Uh, we're working in, you know, with Hampshire Solar as net metering. We're, we're, we're a local SREC developer, so uh, right. so there's certain things that, you know, that the revenue that we generate as a nonprofit government entity will get spun into additional programs and services. Some of them around alternative energy. Okay, what you just said makes sense to me, but that's not what this is. 
Right. It says you'll develop technologies in the region. That made it sound Is that like the answer or the question? The answer. Okay. Um, so I don't know if it, I don't know if that's worth an edit or not, but it just seems to, like uh, a, a bit of a. Um, yeah. I wonder, yeah, I think the word technologies was the yeah. one you're flagging. Okay. And the other comment is um, programs will be uh, such programs will be administered by the Hampshire Council, and I. The only example of a program given is mass save, which I don't think was your intent to say you didn't administer mass. No, in order to, are you sure that's the answer, or is that the question? Response. Okay, because the, the mass save, uh, in order to trigger mass save, you have to trigger section B of the uh, aggregation, which we're not doing through this day. So yeah. Yeah, we'll, I'll, check, I'll check that answer, that sounds odd to me. You know, I, I want to put a clarification out there, I'm just speaking with uh, Ken this afternoon. Um, because this, this answer seems to be almost far more than after cloud needed to say, now that I understand what it's about. Um, because as part of this plan that they're submitting, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is what I was understanding from Ken. As far as the plan goes, they're not going to do any energy efficiency of renewable energy. Um, it's, 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 you know, this is an electrical aggregation piece, and there will be a, there will be a, a portion of that's renewable because of the RPS standard, and maybe we can get some more renewable in there, but that's not really what this answer is directed to. So all these programs that you're talking about are outside of this plan. They're just other things that the Hampshire Council may develop that people could take advantage of. It's, it's really, it's almost misleading to talk about it here because it really had nothing to do with the plan. That's what Ken was saying. This is really just, and the fee they're talking about is the little two mil fee that they get to, you know, that they get for, for doing all of this. Right. That's in our contract. We've already talked about it and agreed to it. That's the fee they're talking about. It's nothing to do with the green option. Uh, it's got nothing to do with the 50-50 split. So it's almost an answer that brings in questions like Scott's. On yeah, the it, it seems disproportionate to that two mil fee. The kind, the right. kind of language used here makes it sound like you're going to become a like a DSM program administrator. Or something. Right, and, and maybe they will, partially funded with the fee, but it's an outside. It's totally outside this program. So I'm taking a look at that that answer. That's yeah, just a little. Yeah. And especially reading it from a GPU perspective, they're going to think, you know, are you guys overstepping the, uh, the spirit? Of, I don't know. Thanks. The main, the main, the most important piece of that answer is, is that we will not be doing 134B. Right. <laughs> that's, that's the key and piece right there. Any other questions? Cool. Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. See you at the end. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I will say I talked with Ken and I did have a few other comments and stuff, but um, it's much, he answered them to my satisfaction or he's going to get back to me with other materials of that I've asked for. I basically, it was things such as when we go, when they solicit a bid and we approve or don't approve of the bid that they solicit, I asked them for really details, how do we go through that process, that type of thing. Um, uh, so it, it, uh, it was almost more than So, but I'm comfortable with where I was after talking with Kevin. Can I just one more question for one of you? To, yeah. Nothing to do with the response, but I, I know you said the public hearing is simple, but is the decision all but certain, or is there still uncertainty about whether they're No, it's just certain. Uh, the DPU has made great strides in the last year in dialing down the process, expediting the process, and moving it forward in a time frame that makes sense. Okay. So. Actually, I do want to bring up one more thing here because in answer to one of these questions uh, says that um, the plan was was given to the mayor on two different occasions, two different versions of the plan was given to the mayor, and, and that, that we then the city then made it available to the public, uh, which uh, availability was provided basically, and that's true. You know, too. If I want to go to the mayor's office and say, "Can I have a copy of the plan?" They would have given them a copy of the plan. But just uh, other than you know the multiple times we talked about it here, and a couple of times that it was talked about at city council, um, uh, is there anything that the that we should be doing to actually you know advertise this and give people more more notice that this is happening? 
respect that. That question kind of led that thought process in my mind. It's not on the web page, or is it accessible to the web page? Uh, is the plan accessible to yeah. the web page? Not that I know of, no. no. But I think you did sort of the city council process got the public to be aware of it. So I don't think you need to do anything before DPUX. Once it becomes a real program, I think it's worth making sure people aren't confused, whether it's the cog does that. Yeah, that'd be a big, yeah, if I mean, that'd be a big press push at that point. Uh, obviously, the postcards go out. Uh, at that point, there's a price on the postcards. Uh, our website will be updated. Uh, HampshireCCA.org will be like a, a real website for uh, the aggregation. We'll try to get the word out as much as possible because, as I said, the aggregation is it's about price, but it's also about educating the public as to what your power is, where it's coming from, how much you're paying for it, how you can green it up, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Okay, okay, that's all I care about. Cool. Okay, All right, go forth and conquer. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Hey, um, this one we should be able to go through fairly quickly. Thank everybody I'm for. Sorry, excuse sure, me. No, I have a question I didn't want to ask with Todd here. Um, born out of complete ignorance, but an article in the Gazette recently talked about how they were unsuccessful at getting, actually getting cheaper prices through aggregation, if I read it correctly. Oh, I have not seen the article so far. How long ago? I can uh, about a month. We'll and I'm just wondering, you know, what, what our expectations are at this point. Yeah, especially, I mean, given that it's an opt-out program, and that's a piece that, you know, I think we, I think it might be good to get more information out because of the opt-out aspect. Yeah, exactly. I mean, worst case, if this doesn't pan out, we ought to be prepared for that. Right. To the level that we do or don't endorse it, and how we, the tone we use when we announce it. Right, right. But at the moment, the way it's, the way it works right now is when they go out for bid, um, we get to see their bids, uh, and, and we get to say yes, that looks good, and and every other town can do that as well. For a practical matter, they don't expect all but maybe one or two towns to even look at it. They actually think a lot of these little towns won't send someone out there to look at the bids and they'll just be accepted. They fully expect Northampton to do so. And if we say, if we say, nope, we don't like that bid, then they will, particularly because it's us, they will probably go out for another bid because we are so large um, that they would probably go out for, and they would redo the bid process. Um, uh, if they do have a number of towns say no, then they very much understand that they really do need to go out for bid again because they just simply haven't gotten the price that's going to be acceptable to people. And that's the piece where I was asking, you know, I would like very much so to see a, a, you know, a logic diagram uh, and a timing of how does the city know a bid's coming up, how do we plug into this process, how do we review it, how do we say, um, you know, give our approval. And I wanted that in detail. Um, this is something I wanted to ask them. So at any time, we can just say, nope, it's no good. Now, the first time, that would be easy to do uh, because everybody would just stay with their basic service. But if you get a year or two down the road and all of a sudden they say, you guys aren't getting the prices, and we say no, then it may mean that Northampton all of a sudden goes back to National Grid. Everybody gets signed back over. Mm -hmm. And whose call is that? Well, that would be ours. Okay. Yeah, that would be ours. If we don't like the bid, any at any bid, if we don't like it, we can we can not participate in the program. Okay. Now it's kind of a, a hassle communication wise because then everybody goes back to mm -hmm. national grid and then if, if they, they manage to get better prices again and we go back, then there's kind of this going back and forth bit, which I think could be confusing to people. So that's the one place that I have some questions. But you know, Cape Light Compact um, has done this for years and has managed to get lower prices, or, yeah, you know, I should verify that. Um, so, we certainly are kind of trusting that they can get better prices than uh, National Grid can. Um, and I think there's reason to believe that they should be able to. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was just gonna say, the only recent article I can find is about their violation of the open meeting law that I can find mm. relative, but uh, that was with I. Uh, 
there's no all the other articles go further back. Vermont Yankee confiscated and violated over meeting law. Yeah. I remember that too, but I don't remember the details of it. I'm not sure yeah, I'm sure it's already it was not about aggregation in general. It might have been a more generic aggregation <laughs> issue. <coughs> I'll just I, I know Hampshire Council was mentioned in the article, but maybe only as an example of an aggregate. So there was, there was an ex I mean, the Hampshire Council uh, separate program has been doing real time, um, uh, real time uh, purchases, that was called, uh, where where basically your electricity price floats with the market. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and it, so that wasn't it? No. Because for years they got away, you know, as expected. Over over the lifetime, you're going to have a lower price, but yeah. you put yourself at risk of a price spike. Right. right. And a price spike hit, and a bunch of towns got really mad. Uh -huh. um, uh, that was but, okay, that wasn't it. Chris, well, if, you could, if you could find that, Scott. Oh, look. Absolutely. Yeah. I may have missed meetings, but are we still talking about a certain percentage of the savings going towards the city doing green and conservation? That was our, that okay. was the ordinance we approved. Okay. Yes, yeah. right. <laughs> and um, uh, so here's a way to kind of, I read it from Ken, from talking with him today. Uh, their, green, their green power option that they were going to do, that is not part of this plan. They're going to do that separate, right. um, which actually allows them, and then they can, of course, uh, market that to anybody in Northampton, and that so it's going to still become right. available to people in Northampton. That's not for the base we wanted. Something. Right, but then the but for the kind of 50-50 split piece, um, as uh, as Bill said, uh, the city council resolution uh, is actually part of the contract. So, uh, and because of that, that's. It, that basically puts it into the, the program. Okay. Kevin was very surprised when these questions came out that DPU did not ask a question about that. Um, so at the moment, they haven't asked a question about it, but it's still in there because because city council did put it that way, and that's the way the mayor signed. So the when contract, his uh, answers that were generic, I was I thought that's what DPU was asking about as our own program. Right, that's, and that's what I wanted to sit down and to talk to Ken about. I wanted, you know, real clear, I wanted clarification on what parts are you talk, is he talking about here. And throughout all those questions, he was just talking about that little two mil fee. Okay. It has nothing to do with the green option, or it's got nothing to do with the 50 50 split uh, in any of those questions. So it hasn't been asked yet. Right. And maybe they haven't seen it, maybe they have no problem with it. Yeah. Well, I did search under aggregation as well. The only other article relevant to this is um, one that was just a few days ago on the second. Enter Council Government uh, Boost Solar Installations with Energy Credit Program, which is basically a rah rah article. It wasn't necessarily, but I mean, it might not have been that big, but, but I, that was a search under aggregation and then one under Enter Council Government. So the big thing is being open meeting violation was focused on essentially something that was going on within the electrical application aspect of their responsibilities. It's not entirely clear what would have happened though, but somebody got fired. Right, in that case, since they haven't aggregated anything yet, it can't be reporting that they failed to get the price because they haven't done it yet. Oh, true. Right. Maybe that's the one I'm thinking of, because I do remember a head rolled. But yeah, there was something a little mushy there, and and the Attorney General thought so, and then cited him with violation of open meeting law. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, caution. <laughs> yeah. Well, we do have that pullback opportunity. <laughs> that's on like a... Once we agree to a bid, is there a sunset on it? Is there a date? Yeah, bid will have a, a, a time period to it. Yeah. Right. You'll notice that one of the questions in here was whether or not there would be variable price bidding and fixed price bidding. And their answer was, remove that paragraph. We inadvertently left it in. So they're not going to do variable. They're just doing fixed. Mm -hmm. you know, and there will be a fixed price for a certain term. Um, and then when that gets near that end of that term, they have to go out for new pricing, and that move up in the same process. And any one of those times, 
we can say, nope, not a good enough price. We don't want to go with that. Yeah. Um, and I think David and Wayne and Ned can probably back me up that a uh, procurement officer, who is a lawyer, is really very specific in meeting all requirements of the law. And, um, uh, and he's looked this over and had multiple questions with each time. So I, I feel a lot more comfortable just knowing that he's basically grilled them. Mm -hmm. um, so with the city's point of view in mind. Yeah. Ready for next? Okay. Um, so the multiple PV systems at the multifamily sites. Um, thank you everybody very much for their responses. Um, I think we actually have pulled together a pretty good letter. Um, has everybody had a chance to read it? Do you want me to read it out loud? Yeah, might as well for the public record. Okay. Ready? Uh, I'll even address the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Addressing the camera. Okay, so this is to uh, Mark Marini, Secretary of Department of Public Utilities. Dear Mr. Marini, I am writing on behalf of the Northampton Energy and Sustainability Commission to seek your assistance in addressing a situation stemming from interpretation of DPU ruling 11-11-C that does not appear to be consistent with the intent of Massachusetts general law. This interpretation has recently stopped two Northampton homeowners from being able to install net metered residential sized PV systems on their homes, despite the fact that several of their neighbors, in exactly the same situation, have fully approved net metered residential sized PV systems installed. Both individuals wish to install a net meter a class one PV system behind their electric meter. However, because they are part of a condominium complex where other homes in those complexes have net metered PV arrays, actually several arrays in each complex, they have been told they may not install a net metered system. This places an undue economic burden on these homeowners as they would be unable to afford the PV systems without the ability to net meter their power production. In Northampton, we have 1,521 residential condominium units on 109 parcels of land. Therefore, if this interpretation of DPU, DPU ruling 1111C were applied, up to 1,412 additional Northampton homeowners could be effectively barred from installing a net metered Class 1 PV system. These condominium kind of units range from two-family homes to owners of living units and apartment buildings to detached single-family dwellings on land held in common through condominium association. The commissioners feel certain that the DPU did not intend for one of their rulings to add complexity or impose an unfair economic burden on individual Massachusetts homeowners seeking to install such systems on their homes. As we are sure you are aware, Mass General Law places a high priority on empowering the adoption, adaptation of solar PV systems in general and small class one systems in particular. For instance, under Mass General Law chapters 164, section 139, class one net metering facilities are provided special status so as not to unreasonably or unfairly obstruct their installation. Under this section of law, Distribution companies cannot impose added fees or costs on these homeowner size systems, and Class 1 facilities alone have no aggregate net metering capacity cap placed on them. Another example of the state's strong support for the adaptation of solar energy systems comes under Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 3. In this case, zoning cannot prohibit or unreasonably regulate the installation of solar energy systems except where necessary to protect the public health, safety, or welfare. Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources interpretation of this section of law is that roof mounted and small and medium sized scale ground mounted solar energy systems must be allowed by right in order to comply with chapter 40A section 3. Therefore we are left to believe that these two isolated cases reflect a misapplication of the DPU ruling 1111C that was cited as a reason for denial of net metering agreement for these two individuals. We request your assistance in clarifying for the public that ruling 1111C is not meant to restrict the installation and net metering of Class 1 PV systems on individual homes. The Commission feels strongly that such a situation would be directly counter to the Governor's and State Legislator's stalwart support of growing the PV market in Massachusetts, and particularly of support for home ownership of PV systems sized to serve a household's electric load. We ask the DP we ask that the DPU take whatever steps are necessary 
to clarify that DPU rulings are not meant to restrict the installation and net metering of Class I PV systems on individual homes, whether those homes are on individual parcels of land or on land held in common, such as for a condominium. We look forward to your response and assistance. Sincerely, Chris Mason, Northampton Energy Sustainability Officer. And then uh, copy so far to Mayor Narkowitz, Representative Kokot, um, Senator Rosenberg, uh, Secretary Richard Sullivan, uh, Commissioner Mark Sylvia, um, uh, Chief Executive Officer Alicia Barton with the Mass CEC, Executive Director of uh, Northeast Sustainable Energy Association, Jennifer Mariposi, or Pacey, I'm not sure if I got a name right, pronounced right, President of the Solar Energy Business Association of New England, Tom Thompson. And I wanted to hear if people want to have more folks added. I thought I would add the two homeowners that we're um, talking to, add them as, as cop to CC. And for myself, I thought maybe some of our local installers, Pioneer Valley Photovoltaics, Northeast Solar, Greenfield Solar Store, Western Mass Solar, and Paradise Energy. Those are all local installers in the Pioneer Valley. And uh, homeowner associations was mentioned, but I don't know which ones to send them to. I'm open to other ideas. Is it, have you reached out to DOER on this? I haven't yet. Yeah. I mean, I, I, we're, we're, we're copying them. Well, but it seems like before you send it out, I just want to make sure they don't think there's some simple answer that's out there. Okay. Uh -huh. And obviously, if they don't think it's a simple answer, it would be nice to them also write a letter on the same issue. Right. It's a tough one. You know, I, I, re I read the DPU, and it seems to me that to this point, that, you know, we're seeing the it's just, it really seems pretty explicit. I don't think, you know, why do they need it? But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how, I mean, I was thinking about seeing the place down in Combs. Yeah, I, I think that, that it's, it really does go counter to what all, you know, is being put out in terms of the encouragement. Right, but I can call, I can, I'll be happy to call DOER. Yes. Um, whatever light they can shed. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would think I would call uh, Meg Lasardi to start with. Yeah. Director yeah. of Green Community. I mean, I, I haven't Carol got her copy on there. I went above her who I copied it to. But, um, um, I mean, as a practical matter, when the letter goes in, they get this sort of letter circulates to everybody, so it doesn't really matter who's on the list. Uh -huh. um, you, know, you sort of made the statement, it's there, and it will take a lot of it. So. Sure. I will call. Uh, I will call the OER before I send before I send it out. Oh, it sounds great. Then. Okay. Um, Bruce. Yeah. Have you know, we heard of any other instances either in that area where uh, other people are having trouble, or any other uh, locations where the situations come up that we can reference? I haven't heard of any others. I didn't realize um, it was two. I thought it was just uh, Marcy. Was there a second? Yeah, there was, a, and the reason why she wasn't here before or hadn't brought it up directly is she was on vacation. So Marcy knew of her and suspected she would be hit with the same thing, but didn't know it for sure. And now she has. Now she has been. Had Rocky Hill also. Yeah, I, I think Marcy's, Marcy's in one of them and she's in the other one. So it's both co housing. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's yeah. probably easier to come up with the names, the, the names of people who didn't get it. I know a lot of them have gone, that, that haven't been whacked, all the, um, I, actually I don't know, I don't think that either, but the, the number of the townhouses and uh, Actually, the, the numbers don't really make sense if you don't get it. Right, right. 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 You've got yeah. seven installations yeah. of factories that are all that beautiful. Yeah. And, and that, this may be more detail you want to later, but I'm sort of, it seems like there's a, a logical approach, which is some condo set aside guaranteed roof area for each person. And then for them, frankly, it's, I'm, clearly I'm totally, it doesn't make any sense not to allow it. I can imagine more nebulous that, you know, if there's a common area and we could all put our panels up next to each other, there's no logic behind it. I can see it starts getting really complicated for, for you to And yet the, you know, the 1111C ruling, and Lou, you, you said the same thing when we both read it, and they're really trying to address a problem with class two and class three size arrays. It had nothing to do with class one. Um, and, and 
the way I read the ruling, it wouldn't have affected class one. But when they went for a subsequent clarification, then they got questions about it. You know, what about class one? And they said, no, we're not going to make an exception. And it was like, well, why did someone even bring this up? You know? But now it's, like Louis said, now it really is solidly in writing there. Here's a theory. A large solar developer brought it up for the express purpose of getting the whole legislation thrown out. No, I believe actually it was the utilities that brought it up huh. because they saw it as a problem for uh, individual homeowners. They said, you know, uh, but they didn't argue it. They brought it up and then there was no one there to push for that to be broadly accepted. So, then that means it reduces, it reduces people's electric instead of just getting what you get out of the solar, you get all you get out of the solar plus whatever goes back and so and there, I think they're scrambling for to get their uh, uh, transmission charges. They're, they're afraid of losing, you know, the revenues that maintain the wires. And, uh, certainly, maybe they just they just need to work it out differently. But there is a threshold for them where smaller electric bills start to um, you know, start to mm -hmm. hurt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I did pass this by Marcy uh, this morning, and she had asked to see it before we sent it out, so I just, you know, said it. And her only comment was where we have a to say actually several arrays in each complex, and she said that makes it sound like one or two. There's nine. <laughs> so she suggested that we change it to actually many arrays in each complex, or uh, a minimum of nine arrays in each complex. So if no one has a problem, I was going to a significant number. A significant, there you go, a significant number of ways. I like that one. It means nothing. <laughs> one is a significant number. It's <laughs> the loneliest <laughs> most important number. <laughs> no, but it does sound more it does sound more accurate than several. Yeah. Chris, one typo, last paragraph. Oh sure. Whether those homes are on. Where are those where are those what? Last sentence. Whether those homes are on individual projects. Thank you. Right. And any other suggestions for who to CC? I mean, someone mentioned homeowners associations, but I don't. Real good, real good solar, RGS. Uh, ah, yes, that's a good one. Yes, real good solar. And, uh, anybody else? No. Okay. In that case, um, I'll call, uh, have a conversation with DOER, add the rest of that to it, and off it goes. Well, you know, the mayor has seen the letter as well, so he's aware of it. I'll just uh, let you know. Okay, Paul, your chat is up. Actually, this is just kind of an update. Um, a number of folks, I don't know if they all spoke to each other uh, from various courts, wrote me about well, what's happening with solar on the landfill. Or is, or is this the ban on styrofoam next? That's what I had on there. Next. Yeah, the styrofoam. Yeah. Also yeah. an update. Okay. So both pieces. Um, Councilor Adams and I are going to be sponsoring an ordinance very similar to, a little more lenient than the Amherst ban on styrofoam that went through uh, about six months ago. Just wanted to give you a heads up that we'll send that to every member of this committee and hopefully on the next agenda, the next meeting, we can have a discussion of that. What we'd be looking for is whether this committee would be a co-sponsor of that or not. So I just, it's just really just a heads up on that coming forward. Can I ask a question? Yes. So, I I'm fine with that, but given that styrofoam is probably a little less control than plastic bags, why not do it both? Good question. It's it's kind of a choice of which do we believe would actually kind of be the first step. So initially, I was kind of looking at a number of things all combined, and uh, other heads thought, well, it might be a better thing to do one at a time. And we thought the styrofoam piece would actually have a good deal of support. We actually have a number of even the fast food places who have already switched over. There are only a couple of places still using it. It was just done in Amherst, and we kind of had the same person that had to help us on all of that. I think the plastic bag issue is going to be a little more, have a little more um, heated community discussion. And so we decided, well, let's move this forward. And the next step, once this is moved forward, we see how that goes, which we're predicting will go fairly smoothly, but it might not. Um, once that goes through, if it goes through, then we have the next discussion, which would be about 
us. The uh, Youth Commission has now talked about this in the last couple of meetings. I believe they're going to be signed on as co sponsors. They've done the research on four levels environmental impact, economic impact, health impact. What was, the other one? There was another one? Cost of the food. <laughs> oh, it was landfill. It was landfill. It was actually, yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, waste stream. Um, they are their next mission and they developed PowerPoint presentation. They are now broadcasting like flying monkeys throughout the community <laughs> and going to the 101 registered restaurants and food service agencies that do uh, to go and delivery services and doing a an informal survey trying to determine who in fact still uses styrofoam and then people who have used alternatives, what's the cost difference, how is it proven to be a burden. And they will have that data by um, the next meeting, theoretically, uh, the first meeting in May. Oh no, there's a meeting tomorrow, uh, next week. They, they meet twice a month, so it's, it could be hard yeah. to keep up with them. But they, so they are uh, they're doing deep research. They've done deep research as well on um, with the League of Women Voters and with Amherst and then with uh, uh, San Francisco's band, New York's band, uh, similar things. So um, there's actually going to be resources to rely on. And in fact, actually, their intent is actually by their research also conduct education while they're going on because this, with plastic bags, there's a lot more systems that use plastic bags. And but there's a finite amount that's manageable that they can approach the restaurants and food service systems like Smith College, Blue Dickens and Hospital, Stop and Shop. Those guys actually all use them too. So, so uh, but hopefully that will there will be enough information and maybe even the PowerPoint presentation which they're preparing for you because they're they're disbanding no, after two more missions. Councilor Adams and I are putting this on. They're doing all the work. <laughs> well, it's, and the reuse cool. committee sponsored this, and they're doing other pieces of the work. So we're just sitting back and letting everybody do the work. They're going to take grab the glory. Back. There was an article, I don't know if people read it in the Boston Globe. Did anybody see this last week? Which actually compared the styrofoam bag, because Brookline just passed it. You might want to read that, because in their conclusion, there's only a slight benefit on multiple levels between the alternatives and styrofoam. So it's kind of a little bit, I went, whoa, this isn't such a slam dunk. I still think it's a good idea. We're going to send this to you, but in all fairness, I'll, I'll try and get that article sent to all of you as well. Did you, send that Did out you see it? Yes, I'll no, try and get that out and send it out to all of you because it's, it goes through all the scientific research, including the fact that in terms of climate change issues and carbon output, that actually all of the alternatives are they're, they're close, but it's not a dramatic difference, as sometimes is stated, that it's actually a little more carbon footprint from the alternatives than from the styrofoam. This doesn't mean we don't do it, but I just want to make sure we have this data that, that the Boston Globe uh, put together. Yeah. So the Board of Public Works took this up at their meeting last night and support the ordinance also. Their only concern with it is that um, the Chamber of Commerce was involved in this and good outreach to the community and the restaurants was going yeah. to happen also. Okay. So, so we, have, we immediately to... reached out to uh, chair of the uh, economic development part of the chamber and we're in conversations with the chamber we want, we want to get their status. And, and the youth commission is also going to the chamber. And in fact, actually what they're planning on doing is doing a presentation. Uh, you, you'll be getting an invite and uh, um, Terry or, or other board members and um, uh, the BOH will too. And it's it's the PowerPoint presentation. They're, Terry gave them the stormwater PowerPoint, so they're exacting the revenge of their own PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but they should have that by the, the final week of May, giving that a full education, and, but, but in conjunction working with the chamber as well. So that's what that's going to keep it under four hours. I, I did, yeah, I actually said make it yeah. fun and humane yeah. as opposed to this. Yeah. Do you have this roof at the schools or the use of styrofoam? Uh, actually, uh, yeah, there, there is styrofoam being used, I believe, at JFK. Well, at JFK and the high school, they yeah, use styrofoam trays. Yeah. That's what actually was started, the Youth Commission getting involved. The, the, the food service contractor is using styrofoam trays. I thought they were using reusable trays right now, but they wanted to go back to styrofoam. Um, I'm not up to 
I think we, we could verify that. That's what I then thought was going on. Yeah, that must be the last I heard was that they were, that was several months ago, that they were using styrofoam. There were some complaints registered by the students. Um, I don't know if they went to, they had their, they had their fiberglass reusable trays. And they're, the reason they said that they were going to styrofoam is that the kids kept throwing away the, the fiberglass ones as they, they, but. You yes. haven't had two school lunch in a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> I did, we had those same fiberglass trays, I don't remember throwing the trays away. So it just seems kind of counterintuitive. You'll see that one of the things yes. from the Boston Globe article is that for all of these issues, that when you can use something again, it's the main thing. That saves everything: energy, climate change, landfill. <coughs> that you want to be able to use the same trays. You want to be able to. They talk about is really the solution to, the, you know, the coffee cups at Dunkin' Donuts is everybody should be encouraged to bring in their own mug. That that's why eventually everybody brings in their own bags. It's not just about plastic bags. It's about encouraging people to use their own bags. And then you really have a savings on multiple levels. And that that was some of the gist of that article. I have a question. Who are the youth? What, what, what is the youth commission? These guys sound dialing. <laughs> they are. Uh, the Northampton Youth Commission. I thought you were talking about us. <laughs> <laughs> the youth aspirants. But no, the, the, uh, the youth commission was established oh, yeah. 12 years ago. 12 years ago. The first chair. Yeah, that was the first chair that chair. It was uh, because a lot of legislation was going through the council that impacted people under 21 without ever talking or discussing with them. Uh, with Claire Higgins and myself, we established a youth commission to refer items to them to discuss and consider and advise the council and the mayor on from their perspective. That's why we actually got them doing stormwater because when all said and done, if they continue to live here and want to own homes here, they're gonna have to pay for it. And right now, they, they went through five meetings deliberating it and have a better comprehensive understanding of the, of the stormwater systems and the, and the challenges than I'd say about 98% of the population and possibly a good percentage of the council. And so the, they, but they're, they are, they are kind of, and they're great. And it's, we're trying to expand the cross section currently right now, it's mostly high school students, the high school, but like to get students, of, uh, not only students, but people of all ages from all communities, from all school systems, or even out of school people. So we're working on that, but, but they're great. Okay. Thinking of all sorts of ways that possibly you could Yeah. How to explain them? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you <laughs> well, they, as I said, they, they, don't, they don't meet in the summer. Once, okay. once they're out of school, they disappear. Okay. They're like bring at noon. <laughs> yeah, to restart so. every year. Okay. Um, so is that enough? Uh, Paul, the start phone? Yep. Yeah. Really, it's just a heads up. It's yeah. Up. Okay. So PV array in the landfill. And this is the one I started, but this was coming up next. I don't know why all of a sudden I have a whole bunch of emails seen from all different people, but somebody's organizing this saying to me, what's the story on the solar and the, and the landfill? So I, I brought it up. I'm gonna, it's on the agenda. For Monday. It's just getting from Monday. It's an update, but I also thought, okay, well, we'll ask that same question here. It's just kind of putting it out there again of who knows anything about this, probably you know the most, but where is it, what are we planning? And well, it's just in its infant stages right now. Uh, most people know that we had a report done through the Smith College Pickering Engineering Program two years ago about solar and landfill and the recommendations of what could happen up there along with looking at uh, wind technologies and bioharvesting materials up there for fuel sources. The recommendation came up to be a PV array. I contacted Sean Newell at Lexington DPW. Apparently, they did a request for qualifications rather than a request for proposals. They felt that that better fit them. I learned that from Dan Boss of the Rivermore Group. Um, so I had two emails in him. I haven't heard back yet. Yeah, well, give me a copy of that. I'd love to do some plagiarism on behalf of Lexington. So that's kind of where we are right now. Um, we haven't made any great strides towards anything at this point as far as uh, do we have an RFP or an RFQ in our hands ready to go out in the street? No, we don't. That's something that we want to start looking at. We've been waiting for the landfill to close and go through closure. It was capped and fully closed last year. The contractor needs to come back this spring and probably reestablish seating and some washouts that happened up there. But once that surface is stabilized, 
uh, probably in the next year to year and a half, we can start looking at potentially doing something like that. Yeah. So it would be about a year and a half before? Well, you'd have to go through DP permitting. we got to go through the RFQ or RFP process. I'm sure it's going to be a lengthy process. And then the construction, you're probably talking a year and a half to two years minimum out before you actually see things going up at a minimum. Is there any sense to having uh, kind of dual tracks, having both things going at the same time, or is that feasible to do? Uh, it all depends on which process we want to go. If you go through an RFP, you're actually soliciting prices with hard dollars and so on, versus yeah. an RFQ, you're selecting a vendor that you want to negotiate a contract with. So two different ways to look at that. There is um, non-landfill property owned out there also, um, a good solid 10 acres of open field that could be used uh, on the same process without going through DEP permitting. It's outside the site assignment. So there's quite a bit of land up there, open mm -hmm. space up there with plenty of southerly exposure. And, and why wouldn't we move ahead on those 10 acres, since it doesn't need any? Well, it's the same process, RFQ, RFP. Um, it's better we've been tied up with stormwater lately. Yeah. And in terms of, of funding for this, those mm -hmm. questions, would it be somebody coming in, putting it up, paying us something back or not? Or is that kind of a final, do we know how the funding for this would I work? can't imagine the city doing anything but doing it, having a third party come in, build, construct, and maintain while we get some kind of benefit out of it. We don't have the resources to take on a three or four megawatt yeah. array. Well, the other thing I would just add to that, the resiliency project that we're now moving forward on with Rivermore and uh, National Grid, which is the final report will be out probably in about two weeks. One of the recommendations in that is to do a power purchase agreement to develop up to a four megawatt system on the landfill. And because of the size of that potential system, it makes it more attractive for a developer then to look at working with the city on getting PV on city facilities to help us increase our energy resiliency at particular facilities. Um, there's some initial financing numbers in the report, but again, you know, you're still, like Ned says, we're talking probably a couple of years for the process to play itself out. But I just want to throw that out as well, that that's, that's going to be included in the report. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Well, so related to power purchase agreement. So, you know, we're doing um, TV on the roof for the bathroom at Florence Fields. And mostly because we ran out of money, we decided we don't have a power purchase agreement rather than the city. Mm -hmm. So we're planning to do that this fall or winter. You're, so we should just do it as a separate thing. That's not a potential add-on to your bigger project. Well, let me well, I'm doing it until other sites. It, it could be, but if you're ready to go. How big is your system? It's small. It's, you know, six. What's the unit? What's the two or three? Six kilowatts? Not six kilowatts. Six kilowatts. Six kilowatts. It's something like it. It's a big enough. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's like a whole unit. Yeah, and yet that's the size we're talking about for other city facilities too, because yeah. with the idea of resiliency, it's it's going to be sized to complement um, a generator as opposed to um, being a, a main primary power production. Yeah. So to, but the resi resiliency only comes in when you have backup power systems attached to it too. If right. they go down as soon as the grid goes down, your your PV is down unless you have battery back. Well, that's that's what we're, well, that's why we would look at this as uh, and the state's changing their mind on that. It will be. As a matter of fact, I think they're going to actually be providing funds. Uh, the grant opportunity that the DOER is coming out with for resiliency um, haven't seen it yet. It's not out yet. But what I've heard is that it could pay for us to turn, say, the Smith Book Array. Um, to spend, I think it would be seventy thousand dollars or so, to make that one islandable. Right. Um, so you know, now that you can. So be on the grid generally, but in a crisis, you both switch. Right. On the grid generally, on as it's as it's doing right now, it's reducing energy use right there, reducing um, uh, the electric bills. Um, but in an emergency, yes, with islands and and you can then keep using it. Right. Like, just like an emergency generator has a transfer switch. We're talking about a similar system in 
and it really would logically tie in with the generator system because yeah. the transfer gear it augments whatever the generator slows down, and then when the sun goes down, the generator goes up. Mm -hmm. but that's the that's the way they've, they've uh, sort of drawn it. And so, so that if we did an RFQ process, um, I would think that if we if we had someone um, selected and designed it, they could they could possibly start building on the old capped parts, right? Uh, on some of the southerly slopes, they could. Um, when we did the phase five, or excuse me, phase four, that cap extended onto the um, unlined area that which was capped also. So basically, we you know we're developing the final elevations across the, the top of the landfill, but the side slopes on um, some of it could be done earlier because they're already established. Okay. Like phase one, phase two, probably part of phase three and part of the unlined, but maybe not phase four. So there could be some partial solar done and sooner than later. Okay. Yeah, I don't think they like to build on the slopes anymore because there's just too much of a chance of sliding and well, stuff. Well, not only that, maintaining and mowing and so on, right. but right. You know, the, the area above is pretty open. I know the Smith Project looked at a lot of uh, side slope um, solar did. also, right. so it might reduce it to maybe a two megawatt array rather than a three to four. Right. Williamsburg's got two proposals for four megawatt arrays on two different spots, one's flat. The other's got a pretty good slope to it. And uh, you know, their engineering is pretty much in place. It's just they're working on, um, I think, asterisks now. But they're working on trying to get their, um, and their leased land agreements. Okay. Is that on, it's on landfill? No. no okay. Landfill. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. On the landfill, you have to worry more about the, you know, the cover, the cover slips up and stuff. Right? Plus, it's my understanding there potentially that there might be better SREC capabilities with brownfield development, landfill development, than green properties. Right. So that's another piece to bring back just to uh, um, <clears throat> the fact that right now no large developers are, are moving forward with, with new projects right now because the SREC program is in between, you know, the first SREC program and the second one. Um, I, I know well I'm not getting my got in SREC. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, but in the new SREC program, which is it finalized now, as Ned said, landfills uh, will get a higher... Um, <clears throat> we'll get a higher value on SREX than greenfields. Um, and I believe parking lots get a higher value even than landfills. Um, so if we had some of these small arrays going over parking lots, then they, they actually will get a better value than, than landfill. Did you get your 1099? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 1099? You get a 1099? Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. I know. I haven't sold an S truck yet, so from my yeah, you gotta pay taxes on it. Okay. <laughs> and the one last thing I'll mention, Paul, is that the other strategy planning thing we're doing is this with the Clean Energy Center, the Strategic Energy Plan, which really is taking a while for them to come up with a final piece. But I, I do know that the let be on the landfill, uh, coupled with uh, sites throughout the community, possibly parking lots, they possibly doing that as one thing. Yeah big project, that's going to be put forward in that proposal too. So two different strategies coming forward, both saying the same thing. Great. Yeah. And the timing. Yes. Alrighty. Um, well, the Community Efficiency Working Group, I put it on here because um, Aiden had been trying to move us forward. Aiden um, wasn't able to make tonight's meeting. And uh, so I, unless someone else wants to do something with this, I have a feeling it's going to be a step over this agenda. Is David there? Yes. I have to leave to see you after leaving 15 minutes. So if there's any you need votes for, no more votes. OK. Nope. Matter of fact, if David left, I think that's it. But we can't do one vote. No, we could. Yes. Um, OK, so we're going to skip that one for the moment. We'll bring it back up again when David's here next time. Um, the next one, we're, we're now kind of down to some fun things. Um, <laughs> if you're a geek. <laughs> uh, so, because of, 
I was applying for the STAR community. Um, I only printed out three copies, but I thought I'd kind of show these. Uh, we were, one thing we, we needed to report on um, was have we made any improvements in greenhouse gas emissions. And in 2001, the city had, um, had an intern do a greenhouse gas emissions inventory for the, for the city. And so I did the best I could to repeat that uh, for 2013. And I was really pleasantly surprised by what popped out. I'm going to put a caveat out here. The, the, the ICLE, the intern that did it before, didn't leave any kind of good records on how they got the information. Uh -oh. Okay? So <laughs> oh. there, there's, some, there's some data there, and there's, but, but it's really difficult to say that I did exactly what they did. So if you're not doing the same method, you may not be comparing apples to apples. Um, but I think I know what they basically did. And I, I repeated it a little bit. And if you look, so this, these, these long bars going down here, this is what the STAR community wanted for giving people different credit. The, the one that's got the little diamonds for the 100% credit, that would be uh, if you were going from your baseline year, and I use 2001 as a baseline year, if you were to reach 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, which is what the state's goal is, that's the trajectory you would have to be on. And that little bar up, the, the little short little one, that's, that's dark, in the upper left-hand corner, that's Northampton. Um, and that's, really? all, that's all of Northampton. So we're just, below right. we are, the ID. We are tracking faster than we need to. Now, I found, I saw, that I found just really, you know, you know heartening. Because I like, wow, at least something's went. And that, but I, I thought it would be worth it to kind of look at, and if anybody wants a copy of this, you can see how I came up with my, my information this time. Some of it is prorated, like vehicle miles traveled, PVPC came up with vehicle miles traveled. Department of Transportation has statistics on how many vehicle miles would be done by, you know, what the, what the, you know, what the mile per gallon is for cars versus trucks and stuff. Uh, PVPCs was based on how many miles the trucks are driving and stuff. And so I did some prorating from state data and PVPC data and stuff. So it's not like we, we model our energy use for cars and trucks locally. Um, similarly, with fuel oil uh, for residents and commercial, I took state level, state, state amount of data, um, prorated it based on local uh, assessors data that we have here, um, and some state you know, number of businesses we have here versus the number of businesses statewide. So that's the kind of um, um, Estimate, estimation I did, and those those are probably the squishiest ones. But the electricity and natural gas, those are hard numbers. Those come from the utility. The utility just says how much we use. Um, and I just wanted to walk through what I think are some of the, it's rather informative, and when I saw the data, it all made sense. So I think, it, it, you know, maybe, I wasn't trying to aim for this data, when I saw it, it all made sense. Since 2001, Northampton has reduced the amount of electricity that they use, that they use on an annual basis. Not by a lot, by a little bit. So we went from you know, 241 million kilowatt hours down to 237 million kilowatt hours. Um, and that's actually based on 2010 data, which is the only data I could get from the National Grid. Um, but if you look, the CO2 emissions uh, dropped by a lot. And so the reason why is that we've reduced our electricity use a bit. But the electricity is much, much cleaner. Much cleaner. So this is, you really have to credit it to natural gas as opposed to coal. Um, that's a big switch that we made. So that's, you know, that's, that's a big case where we're getting stuff. But that's not at Northampton. Yeah, that's right. No, no, but this is, Northampton can take credit for it. But, but so when I look at, you know, that little graph and it makes you feel like Northampton's doing great, yeah. I think the bigger story is other towns could repeat this. You know, um, and I also have municipal data in, in here. So anytime the you know, fuel oil use, um, our diesel and gasoline use, I threw those numbers in as well. So I, I do know, you know, straight from municipal data. And I think they did that in 2001 as well. So um, uh, so it is a little bit of Northampton. But it really this is almost a bigger picture than just Northampton. So Chris is the optimist. And so I'm, I'm the pessimist. No, I'm not, I'm not the optimist. But this isn't, this is, 
Right. I, 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 here's, I mean, because I looked at the same data because I was putting it at Star okay. stuff. So this is, this is great. I, you know, I believe everything Chris said, and I think it's wonderful where we're going. I also, we need to follow the graph through. So if the goal is really an 80% reduction in both greenhouse gas emissions and fossil fuels, we, we and the state is sort of, has really focused on the low hanging fruit. And it seems like as we start revising sustainable enhancement the plan, we may want to think, what really are the steps to get to 80% mm -hmm. in the time period? So I, I sat in on a, um, a webinar that Berkeley gave about their pieces, because Berkeley's been really aggressive in moving forward, <coughs> and they're a little, they, they began earlier, so a little farther ahead. And they were sort of the same thing. They were saying, okay, if we're really going to do this, this means a massive change in single occupancy vehicles to other things. And so it seems like, I mean, I think this is wonderful, but I, I like to do the next step of taking this and let's go forward 50 years and figure out how do we really get down to the steps. Thank you, Wayne. I was, I was going to end with that. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> well, the other way of saying that is these are not straight lines. It's easy to get the initial reduction, right. and then it tapers off. So it's, it's a little misleading to show them as a straight line to 2053. Right. Right. You know, yeah. um, we might I, actually be behind if you do it as like an exponential decay. Oh, and, and everybody. Is. It's not like we're right. we're still yeah. in those places. But. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, uh, this National Grid and Columbia Gas haven't gotten the annual figures yet. Uh, I wanted annual figures from 2009 to 2013 because mm -hmm. that's when we have good solid municipal figures for, and they haven't gotten that to me yet. But when when they do. Um, I think what we're going to see is you're not going to see an exponential curve. You're going to see a jagged line. No, I'm talking about yeah. the model trends that, that you're comparing to, whether it's 80% or 60% right. or 40%. Yeah. They're not straight lines. It's, they won't be, right. They'll be, over, they'll be oversimplified, to say yeah. that. Yeah. Right. And, and yet, I'm not sure it will be a, an exponential curve either, because I think it very well might oh, that's true. do that. That's true. No? But um, let me just finish here with you know, some of the other things I saw. So natural gas. Uh, went up and heating oil went down um, and I think that probably reflects more people either putting you know building with natural gas systems or converting over to natural gas systems both commercial and, and uh, residential um, and then because gas natural gas is is cleaner then that's a good place where we got some co2 reduction as well um, gasoline and diesel they both um, the amount used went up and that's despite the fact that we have better cafe standards, and we have higher efficiency in our cars. So if my, if my data is right, and this actually makes sense though, we, we're increasing our gas mileage, but we're driving more. You know, you're, you're, you're driving farther, and there's more cars on the road. Um, so all of these trends make sense to me, and I think all of these trends can inform just what Wayne was saying. You know, where do we go from here? This We've almost gotten lucky at this point, you know, uh, for <coughs> people's efforts. But I'm surprised about that last one, though. <coughs> Since the recession, driving is down, and, and everyone's speculating, is this a permanent thing, or is this still recession-induced, and I don't think any of us really know that. Okay. Well, this is compared to 2001. Yeah. But it's also, it's, it's regionally informed, too, given, yeah. given who's driving to where and to what job, <coughs> what jobs changed, and started to diminish, for instance, in the hilly regions that people were going to, going to Springfield, going yeah. to that point. So they were actually possibly driving farther and greater distances with more efficient cars. But the, those the, those factors changed and were informed by the recession as well, too, I imagine. But the, oh, that, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, this is the thing that gets me all bugged up when Boston keeps talking about an increased gas tax offset mm -hmm. tolls and things like that. One point, in fact, actually, their commuters commute far less, and they have the MTA system. That actually is a regressive tax on them. Community. On this region, right. yeah. Right. Right. So, what did you say? Pioneer Valley gets their vehicle miles, vehicle miles traveled. I mean, because if, the, if there was a discrepancy in the 2001 versus 2013 surveys, okay, 2001, I based on the the ICWI, uh, right. and I don't know the internship where the intern got right. the data. Right. I, mean, I simply don't know where they got right. it. So that's probably one of the. the Least that that's the squishiest one to compare. Yeah, that, I mean that could be behind that increase because it the could be. Was an orange. It could be, and yet there <laughs> is, you know, I think there's been some data behind the idea that if you buy a higher efficiency car, 
you use Avenger, so you can right. You do. Right. right. You drive more. Yeah. Right. Because you, you can afford to drive more, so you do. Um, uh, uh, what, where, where, for my data, what I did was uh, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, the, the big publication they put out, uh, part of that was a greenhouse gas inventory that was done by UConn students. I'm sorry, U, uh, UMass students. Um, so they put down, and, and I got their data sets. Um, and so that's where I put my vehicle model travel from. And then I prorated that into Northampton's numbers. Um, so, yeah, that's the squishiest. And yet, I do believe the ICLE inventory was just as squishy. Um, uh, it's, it's actually one of the problems. One of the reasons I haven't really pushed to do a greenhouse gas inventory, but I, I know very often the data is basically just a reflection of what's happening in the state. Which doesn't really say what you're doing locally. Um, but altogether, I found it fascinating enough, and I really thought it would be worth bringing it up to the commission. Um, it's informative, and um, and it shows how much more we have to go. Because you're right, this is easily the low hanging fruit. You didn't have to try. But I do like the fact that I mean, had it started it, actually, were we trending up towards the upper line? That would have been very discouraging. This is more encouraging to do exactly as Wayne's recommending is to actually think beyond yeah. to say, okay, we have, we, we are, we, we're harvesting the low-hanging fruit successfully. If we weren't, that would be a drag. But the fact that we are incentivizing this it allows us to say, okay, well, that was, that wasn't a lot of heavy lifting there. We can actually do better. And I, I, I think so in that respect, it's, it's inspiring. I, I Chris, the ICLE study, was it sub, were there subsets of the data like for city municipal buildings? Yes. Municipal vehicles? Because I would love to see a similar um, comparison of then to now for the things that are directly within the city's control. Okay. And I highly suspect that the ICLE study did not include all of the municipality. Um, I mean, my experience when I first started working here was two or three years in, someone would mention a certain building and I would say, what, the city owns another building? Oh. <laughs> so, you know, me directly trying to get all the data, and yeah. it took me a couple of years to actually identify right. and put into one place everything that we own. Um, I truly doubt that it could included all some facilities. So it would be very difficult without having their detailed data mm. to say what we're doing. What I can say is that we do have hard data from 2009 to 2013. And I don't know exactly what, the star communities did ask to plot it, but they did it in a very funny way. They said, pick 50% of your energy use and plot how you reduced energy there. And so I picked. 50% of the energy use, making sure to grab the ones that have had the biggest increases. <laughs> I really biased it. And in that one, they had a very similar type graph. And so you're only counting our, our best 50%. Our graph went like this. Don't, 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 don't. Kind of jogged all over the place, but it was way below the 100% one. Um, and um, I haven't done it for the whole thing, but we have. I mean, we've reduced, we've, we've been dropping energy use. And that's just, I generally think of just how much energy we use. I haven't thought of how much greenhouse gases we've reduced. And I think we probably would do pretty good there because we've swapped over, uh, we've gone away from fuel oil uh, a lot. So we've switched to natural gas. So that would just magnify our effects. Um, and again, in the last four years, the state's renewable portfolio standard, um, our, our energy is getting, our electricity is getting cleaner. Um, you know, and I think in the last four or five years, it may not be the biggest steps, um, but I think both of those would show that we're doing well. I think that's worth doing because that, sure. that's worth some public outreach, you know, leading that by example. Okay. Yeah, I'll 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 plot that. I'll I'll plot that and move it to the next. Um, basically, and I think the, the as big a value in this is just having the inventory because you know, like I'm always curious how the CO2. Um, footprint breaks out between these sectors. Never mind the improvement from 2001. Just a snapshot of today. You know, I was always under the assumption that vehicles are a big part of our CO2 footprint, and this confirms it. Yeah. Yes, it would be. Right. 
One thing that's going to happen to the graph, and Scott, is that the technologies, um, the current net zero housing technologies aren't necessarily affordable, but but they're going to influence all the houses built forward. Um, and, and so you're going to see an energy consumption downturn the same way that, like, in 2001, the Prius said, okay, this is the way you're going to, you can do it. And now look at, you know, the variety of cars that plug in down there. Um, so you know, I think that I think there is uh, some technology that's going to be pushing the graph, at least holding it low, yeah. if not pushing it lower. Yeah. Um, you know, we went CFLs. We're going to go LEDs. You know, ha half the energy bulb by bulb. You know, and it's true that may uh, offset the uh, diminishing returns of getting oh, low hanging fruit. Right. Numbers. Yeah, and uh, you know, we're never going to. Well, I guess we could go past zero on, uh, you know, the, the energy producing houses, but it's that's not going to show in our, in our necessarily in our consumption. I mean, you can't consume, when you're measuring consumption, it's hard to measure less than zero. Mm -hmm. um, so eventually, you know, it, it could flatten out. But, um, it, um, towards Wayne's idea of kind of planning out how you get there, I think it's worth looking at the states. Um, energy plan because they do just that. They they say we're going to get this much from increased cafe standards. We're going to get this much from cleaning up our our electric grids. We're going to get this much from efficiency. We're going to get this much from behavior change and stuff. And they, they do they map it all out. You know, um, uh, and I'll I'll bring a copy in for next time or maybe I'll just forward it to folks that they they want to see that. Um, uh, it really is the way to think about it. You have to kind of put together little pieces <clears throat> from all sorts of different attempts um, and identify which ones are the hard ones. Well, one last thing I will mention, we'll go over that head and run the landfill. <laughs> um, one thing that uh, I truly doubt they had in the ICLEI report and I did not include in this report um, because it just, actually I didn't have to play the hard numbers yet. But the landfill does report CO2 emissions um, you know, come from the landfill, either you know, any kind of methane that they think escapes um, versus any methane that gets burned off, however it could. And um, the CO2 emissions from the landfill swamps all other missile emissions, just dwarfs them. Um, what? Yep. Emissions from the landfill dwarfs all other municipal emissions. Our buildings, our gas, diesel, it's not dead. It's not dead. No, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, totally it's the dead. trash we produce. Yeah. Right? Wow. Yeah. It does. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll bring those figures in too, because I've, I've been getting more information from them. And, uh, and so, I, that, those are not included in here. That, and that's that even with change. the methane burners. Yeah. <clears throat> we have uh, Amoresco doing landfill gas energy, and surplus gas is, or when they're offline, is used through our uh, enclosed layer system. So it is all burned. It is. Yeah. But it's um it's all burned, but there's parts of the landfill that um see so, I mean you have a cap on the landfill, but you have an open side and then you have a section that's not capped yet. It's all capped now. It's all capped now, okay. But but for a while there was a section that was going to be that section that wasn't capped would have been open gases could have escaped. It so when it's all capped, it, could, it is all capped. Yeah. So so those, now that it is all capped, yes. what will it look like next time we do this? Uh, um, Dramatic decrease? They should, I've been told, um, David Valenta is, yep. is the one I was talking to, and he says that we should expect to see our CO2 emissions, I mean our, our, our greenhouse gas emissions dropping off at this point. Right. Because we're not adding anything new. There is a full cap over it. Um, but there are other reasons why there may have been stuff escaping from the landfill before it was capped. The fact that even the stuff under the cap had an avenue out mm -hmm. through where the cap wasn't put yet. Mm -hmm. All rather standard. We've got that now. So yeah. uh, it's all it's all least resistance. Yeah. 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 But it really is amazing that the, the greenhouse gas emissions from the landfill are, are big. Yeah, that's it is, yes. Uh, so, styrofoam. Well, if that could help. <laughs> Well, we won't, regardless, bad or otherwise, we're not putting any styrofoam in the... Yeah, no, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, it's not a big styrofoam bubble.
pulls things in really well. There you go. It off gases and retains gases. Two trees in one. A giant clamshell styrofoam container. <laughs> Okay, just to um, uh, real quickly, just go through the last ones quickly. Um, uh, the Pace uh, support letter never got written. Um, I still plan on it. There's an event uh, here this weekend where Rosenberg is having. Um, yeah, Senator Warren's coming. Right, and so. We didn't get invited. I might be able to do a little chat, and I'm going to try to make that if I can. But um, I haven't heard something where I just got over overwhelmed. I didn't get a support letter out. Green Community's grant proposal, just to let you know, um, the Smith vocational air sealing uh, report came back, and the buildings aren't as bad as we thought, uh, really to the point where we're not going to apply for funds for it. Um, the idea instead... That's good news and bad news. <laughs> it is good news and bad news. It, it actually could be fun if we can work with Smith folk, but I would really like at this point is, I would love it if their teachers maybe contract with a a BPI certified contractor to, to run an annual um, air sealing training, you know, maybe it's some weekend. And they just keep continuing to do a piece of the wall, a, a piece of that ceiling, a piece of the ceiling, a piece of the ceiling, and just do it for free. This air seal, it's still worth it. There's, there are some leaks there, but they just weren't as bad as they thought. So, uh, that was class of 2015. <laughs> exactly. You know, you 2016, <laughs> okay. <laughs> they can even put their number in it. <laughs> right. So, uh, so that's where uh, that stands. Um, uh, and the water treatment plant uh, is being analyzed right now, and we're going to be having a conversation about it tomorrow. Um, uh, I don't know, you don't, don't know if you know about that, but nope. Jim, Jim Laurel is on the call, uh, Greg's on the call. Okay. Um, and we're looking at getting their analysis in by early next week. Uh, and Scott, as you su suggested to keep it broad, um, it turns out the that big electric heater uh, is on a basically on a rheostat, so it's it's not the primary cause. But they they are saying that they're saying that the total dehumidification process is inefficient, and so looking at it very broadly, they are going to be proposing ways to increase the efficiency of that dehumidification process, and making sure the DPW is comfortable that it still works. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a big piece. Um, uh, uh, Mass Municipal Energy Group uh, has remained confusing to me, so I, I'm not going to provide ways for you guys to get onto that until I have a chance to <laughs> get clear on that. And PVPVs adopt our next future. I had it on my plate to uh, draft a, um, an endorsement. Um, it was suggested that I contact PVPC. They might have direct, you know, language already written that I could use. I did that right away. My conversation somehow got distracted into something else, and I kind of realized today they never got me that. So that's still kind of in the works. Just wanted to let you know where we stood. Um, and that's all I've got. Unless anybody else wants to be so fast. Uh, no. We'll do the adjourn, even though we don't have a quorum to vote. But Actually, we do have a quorum. We're doing a quorum? Okay. Yes, we do. Motion to adjourn? That's it. All in favor. Aye. Aye.